Hyponatremia is commonly defined as a serum sodium concentration below 130 millimoles per liter. It affects anywhere from 1 to 15% of hospital patients. Most cases require no treatment. However, with acute causes of hyponatremia, the effect can be life-threatening. Now, sodium plays a critical role in the body. Sodium is distributed unequally within the body compartments. There are three main compartments in our body the intracellular compartment, the interstitial compartment, and the intravascular compartment. The intravascular and interstitial space make up the extracellular fluid and is where we find most of the sodium. Approximately 145 millimoles per liter of sodium occupies the interstitial and intravascular compartments. In the intracellular compartment, there is about 12 millimoles per liter. Sodium is a positively charged ion, the main cation in the extracellular space. Now, the sodium potassium pump is the transporter which makes sure to maintain higher concentrations of sodium in the extracellular space by swapping it or exchanging it with potassium ions. Hence, the main cation in the intracellular space is potassium about 155 millimoles per liter. Water is a molecule which can easily diffuse through the extracellular and intracellular spaces or can travel via channels such as aquaporin channels. Hyponatremia is easily classified according to volume status hypervolemia, normovolemia, also known as euvolemia, and hypovolemia. So a hypervolemic hyponatremia is where someone will have low serum sodium with fluid overload. They can have peripheral edema or fluid in their lungs. Euvolemic hyponatremia is someone with low serum sodium but whose fluid status is normal. Hypovolemic hyponatremia is someone with low serum sodium who is dehydrated and so would have a fast heart rate and low blood pressure, for example. Before delving into the causes of hyponatremia by dividing them into their fluid statuses which we learned, we must firstly question whether the hyponatremia is a false reading, for example. It's very important to remember that many factors can create a falsely low sodium reading. This is called pseudo-hyponatremia. An example is hyperglycemia. Now, normally after eating, blood sugar rises and insulin gets secreted by the pancreas. Insulin binds onto receptors on cell surface to allow expression of GLUT transporters, which facilitates glucose moving inside the cells. With patients who have poorly controlled diabetes, glucose stays in the blood. As a result, glucose becomes an effective osmol and draws water from the cells, diluting the intravascular space, resulting in pseudo-hyponatremia. As a result, if you take blood and measure serum osmolality, this would be increased because you're having more osmols, more solutes in the intravascular space. Similarly, mannitol can also cause shift of water into the intravascular space. Mannitol is used, for example, in cases of increased intracranial pressure. Mannitol is a molecule that cannot move through cells. It functions to reduce the amount of fluid in the interstitium and in the intracellular compartment by drawing the fluid into the intravascular compartment. This will cause pseudo-hyponatremia as well. So mannitol and uh, glucose, if you take blood and measure serum osmolality, this would be increased. Osmolality, again, is a measure of the number of dissolved particles in a fluid. When you have high plasma osmolality, it means you have high numbers of solutes, such as glucose and mannitol, for example. Hyperlipidemia 
and hyperproteinemia also causes pseudohyponatremia. But when serum osmolality is tested, it will be normal. Now the reason is that when blood is taken out for analysis, lipids and proteins interfere with the laboratory analysis of electrolytes, creating a falsely low sodium level. TERP, also known as transurethral resection of the prostate, can cause pseudohyponatremia. And this is because large volumes of uh, mannitol, for example, or glycine, um, is used for bladder irrigation and can be absorbed by the body. And so as mannitol and glycine is in the intravascular space, it will absorb water from the other compartments, result in dilutional hyponatremia. The serum osmolality is also normal in this case, and this is perhaps due to the mannitol and gly um, glycine um, leaving the intravascular space quickly. So those were four examples of pseudohyponaturemia. Note that the serum osmolality is high or normal in these cases. Most true causes of hyponaturemia are associated with a low plasma osmolality, which means low number of solutes in plasma. Let's first begin by looking at hypervolemic hyponatremia. Causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia is due to redistribution of water into the extracellular space, particularly the interstitial compartment. The main causes of this are congestive cardiac failure, liver cirrhosis, and nephrotic syndrome. In congestive cardiac failure, the heart is unable to pump blood out effectively. There is low arterial blood flow, resulting in increased thirst and release of antidiuretic hormone from the brain. So there is plenty of sodium, but more water, resulting in hypervolemic hyponatremia. The antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH, stimulates water retention in the kidneys, in the body, further causing hypervolemic hyponatremia. Someone with hypervolemia will have elevated JVP, will have crackles in the lungs, dyspnea, a wet cough, and swelling of the uh, peripheral legs, for example. In congestive cardiac failure, the serum osmolality is low because there is no increase in solutes. There is only increase in water in the extracellular space. Other causes of hypervolemic hyponatremia is liver cirrhosis. In liver cirrhosis, there is reduced albumin synthesis. Normally, albumin, which is a protein, retains water in the intravascular space. With low albumin, water does not stay in the intravascular space and rather moves into the interstitial space, resulting in edema. Sodium also shifts to the interstitial space, resulting in hyponatremia. On top of this, in liver cirrhosis, there is portal hypertension, which together with low albumin will decrease circulating arterial volume, leading to a reflex whereby the body will uh, have increased thirst and also a release of antidiuretic hormone again. And this, as we know, will cause hypervolemic hyponatremia. In nephrotic syndrome, there is damage of the glomerulus, allowing proteins such as albumin to leak out, resulting in hypoalbuminemia. With low albumin in plasma, water is not retained in the intravascular space, causing a reduced arterial volume, stimulating thirst and antidiuretic hormone release. This will lead to hypervolemic hyponatremia.
In congestive cardiac failure, nephrotic syndrome, and liver cirrhosis, serum osmolality is low because there are no extra solutes in the blood stream. Rather, there are a reduced number of solutes because we have reduced albumin, for example. In congestive cardiac failure, nephrotic syndrome, and liver cirrhosis, the urine sodium will be usually low. This is because the kidney, the nephrons, still work and can reabsorb sodium to try and maintain normal sodium levels. Chronic renal failure and hypothyroidism is also a cause of hypervolemic hyponatremia. In chronic renal failure, the kidney is unable to filter blood effectively. There is a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. And so what happens when you have a reduced perfusion to the kidneys, um, it will actually activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, also known as RAS, in order to increase the glomerular filtration rate. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system results in the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex and also the stimulation of antidiuretic hormone from the brain. Aldosterone will reabsorb sodium and water for that respect. Antidiuretic hormone attempts to increase glomerular filtration rate by increasing intravascular volume with water. This all will result in hypervolemic hyponaturemia through dilution again. The mechanisms by which hypothyroidism causes hyponaturemia can be interpreted as low thyroid levels causing bradycardia and reduced glomerular filtration rate. Bradycardia will cause a decrease in cardiac output, which means reduced arterial pressure or volume, and the body will detect this change in volume pressure, and thus ADH is released as a response to try and retain water. Um, and this, of course, will lead to hypervolemic hypo, hyponaturemia. The low glomerular filtration rate, as we have learned, will stimulate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which will attempt to retain water and sodium via multiple mechanisms. In chronic renal failure and hypothyroidism, serum osmolality is reduced. However, in both chronic renal failure and hypothyroidism, urine sodium levels will be high. This is because the nephron are unable to retain sodium. So those were examples of hypervolemic hyponaturemia. The most common cause of euvolemic hyponaturemia is syndrome of inappropriate ADH uh, secretion. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH is a non-physiological release of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, from the posterior pituitary or from an ectopic source. ADH works by increasing the expression of aquaporins in the collecting ducts of the kidneys. And so if you have so much ADH, inappropriate secretion of ADH, there will be a lot of aquaporins, which means a lot of water retention. Water retention leads to fluid overload, which stimulates the heart to release uh, ANP and also BNP. These are natriuretic peptides. Water retention increases also the glomerular filtration rate in the kidneys. But also, together with ANP and BNP, which are hormones, they both will decrease the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. They decrease the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system because they are trying to tell the body not to retain any more water. Inhibition of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system means reduced aldosterone. When you reduce aldosterone, this means that sodium is not reabsorbed 
through the aldosterone dependent sodium channels in the kidneys. Because sodium is not reabsorbed, it will be peed out. And this is called naturesis. With syndrome of inappropriate ADH, the urine sodium is high. And the reason is, again, aldosterone is not reabsorbing sodium. And so you have sodium being peed out. Important thing to remember about syndrome of inappropriate ADH is that over time, long term, there is renal adaptation in the kidneys that will reduce the number of aquaporins by itself to reduce water retention. So as a result, you will pee more water, you have diuresis together with the existing naturesis from the reduced aldosterone levels. And so because of this mechanism, you get a euvolemic picture. You get a euvolemic hyponaturemia. The serum osmolality in syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is low because in SIADH, you are retaining water, diluting the existing uh, solutes. And so technically you have low amounts of solutes. The other rarer cause of euvolemic hyponatremia is beer potomania. This is an oversimplification, by the way, and the exact pathophysiology is questionable. Chronic alcohol drinkers who are not malnourished will consume large volumes of alcohol, which will cause hypervolemia. However, will have normal solute concentration because they are not malnourished. And so they can excrete water and solutes together. And they are able to balance sodium and water levels in the body because of this. Patients who drink a lot of alcohol, such as beer, may not consume enough nutrition. Beer is a good example, as people who drink a lot of beer develop this physiological effect whereby they reduce the number of carbohydrates and other foods they eat because of the sensation of not being hungry. Thus, chronic beer intake and malnutrition will result in low proteins, uh, reduced solutes, as well as you have a lot of fluid in your body. When you are fluid overloaded, ADH is suppressed and you pee out all the water. You have water excretion. But at the same time, the body will obviously try to retain the solutes as well as try to retain some water. As a result of this mechanism, you get a euvolemic hyponatremia. The mechanism obviously is a bit confusing, but hopefully it kind of makes sense. So next, let's talk about hypovolemic hyponatremia, the causes. And hypovolemic hyponatremia reflects true volume depletion. The main causes are diuretics, vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, burns, and pancreatitis, as well as adrenal gland insufficiency. Let's begin by looking at diuretics. Diuretics causes an increase in water and sodium excretion. The main diuretic that causes hyponatremia are the thiazide diuretics, as they cause depletion of sodium and chloride ions. And they do this by inhibiting a co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule that essentially reabsorbs sodium and chloride ions from the kidneys. Loss of sodium means naturesis in the kidneys. Thiazides have no effect on aquaporins, and so sodium drags water with it, and so you also get diuresis. You lose water. This causes hypovolemia because you are losing water, and also causes hyponatremia because you are losing sodium. As a result of diuresis and naturesis, the body will trigger an antidiuretic hormone response to try to retain some of that water. However, as we know, antidiuretic hormone increases aquaporins in the collecting uh, tubule, but its role is only uh, being able to reabsorb 10% of water. So the outcome is that you still get hypovolemia and hyponatremia at the end.
someone who is hypovolemic will be thirsty and dry. So they will have dry mucous membranes and have reduced skin turgor. They are also tachycardic and hypotensive. So another cause of someone who has hypovolemic hyponatremia is someone who is vomiting. When you vomit, you lose water and electrolytes. Loss of water means hypovolemia. But with vomiting, you can also vomit some acid from the stomach. When you vomit acid, this increases serum pH because you are losing protons, hydrogen. Kidneys will try to compensate by excreting bicarbonate with sodium. This increases sodium excretion. Excretion of bicarbonate from the body reduces serum pH back to normal. And remember, it is the excretion or secretion of sodium in the kidneys together with the bicarbonate, but also the vomiting up of the electrolytes is what leads to hypovolemic hyponatremia. Point to remember is that diuretics and vomiting will give you an increase in urine sodium. Diarrhea, you also are losing water and electrolytes. Loss of water means hypovolemia. Electrolyte loss is in the form of sodium bicarbonate. Loss of bicarbonate will lead to acidemia, so a reduced pH in serum. In an, in an attempt to normalize this, the kidneys will uh, secrete hydrogen ions, will excrete hydrogen ions from in urine. Hydrogen is secreted from the kidneys through ammonium chloride, and this will stabilize serum pH. The loss of sodium in diarrhea with bicarbonate is what contributes to hypovolemic hyponatremia. Hypoaldosterone can cause hypovolemic hyponatremia. Normally, the adrenal cortex produces and releases aldosterone. Aldosterone works on the kidneys uh, to reabsorb sodium in the body in exchange for potassium. Causes of hypoaldosteronism include Addison's disease and uh, spironolactone, which decreases the effects aldosterone has on the distal tubule and collecting ducts. Low aldosterone reduces expression of sodium and potassium ATPase pump and also aldosterone dependent sodium channels. As a result, aldosterone cannot retain sodium increasing uh, sodium and water excretion, so increasing naturesis and diuresis. As a result, you get hypovolemic hyponatremia. Remember, water will follow sodium. Diuretics, vomiting, and hypoaldosteronism will give you an increase in urine sodium. Sweating, burns, Pancreatitis causes water and sodium loss from the intravascular space, leading to hypovolemic hyponatremia. In sweating, you obviously lose your sodium and water from your sweat glands, so depleting intravascular space. If you have burns, you're losing water and electrolytes from the soft tissue injury. You're depleting, uh, lowering the intravascular space. With pancreatitis, it's actually third spacing. So all the water and the sodium is going into a third space outside the intravascular space, resulting in hypovolemic hyponatremia. The renal system attempts to retain water and sodium as much as they can. And that is why with sweating, burns, and pancreatitis, you have low urine sodium levels. And so those were the most important causes of pseudohyponatremia, hypervolemic hyponatremia, euvolemic hyponatremia, and hypovolemic hyponatremia. The clinical presentation of uh, hyponatremia often don't come 
about until it's less than 120 millimoles per liter. But again, by definition, it's less than 130 millimoles per liter. Symptoms generally include headaches, lethargy, malaise, and nausea and vomiting for people who are developing hyponatremia slowly. And again, the clinical presentation of hyponatremia also usually present with changes in fluid status, which we talked about, hypervolemic, euvolemic, or hypovolemic, which is very important to look at. However, if the drop in sodium is rapid, fluid shift into the intracellular compartment can be rapid and can lead to brain swelling, cerebral edema, and also non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. For example, in cerebral edema, usually there is equilibrium of electrolytes between the intracellular and extracellular compartments in the brain. And also with the water levels, uh, which are appropriate in each compartment. If there is a sudden drop in serum sodium, for example, there, this will mean that water will shift over to the brain tissue where more of the electrolytes are. This will cause cerebral tissue to swell, which can lead to seizures. Similarly, in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, there is no issue with the heart whatsoever. Rather, the sudden drop in serum sodium will cause fluid to shift into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. Remember, hyponatremia is not a disease, rather a manifestation of all those causes of hyponatremia we talked about earlier. Electrolyte urea creatinine help identify hyponatremia, which is defined by less than 130 millimoles per liter. Then there are other investigations that can help differentiate between the different causes. These include plasma osmolality, whether it is high, normal, or low. Remember, in pseudo-hyponatremia, it's typically high, um, and true hyponatremia, it's typically low. Then you can check urine osmolality as well as urine sodium concentration. Remember that true causes of hyponatremia will have low serum osmolality. Management of hyponatremia will depend on the causes as well as the symptomatology. In general, mild asymptomatic hyponatremia is of little clinical significance and requires no treatment. For hyponatremia, which is pretty low, but the person is still asymptomatic, or for ongoing hyponatremia, treatment should be initiated. And this includes a strict fluid restriction between 750 mL to 1.2 liters. And this will hopefully aim to increase serum osmolality. Also, the administration of slow isotonic saline is recommended. The isotonic saline will increase serum volume and hopefully suppress the release of ADH. However, in acute severe hyponatremia, which tends to be symptomatic, Management should be quick to prevent cerebral edema. This includes resuscitation if necessary, strict fluid restriction, as well as the administration of slow hypertonic saline. Hypertonic saline will help increase serum sodium levels. This will then draw water into the intravascular space. Once the water is in the intravascular space, the body can excrete the sodium as well as the water and balance out the sodium levels. Again, the management is slow correction of sodium levels. Remember, the plasma sodium concentration should be slowly corrected, should be slowly increased. For example, a maximum of 12 millimoles per liter during the first 24 hours. And this is in order to prevent a serious complication of rapid sodium correction called central pontine uh, malinolysis. This condition is due to rapid shift of water from the intracellular space into the extracellular compartment, leading to shrinkage of brain cells. For example, if you give someone too much hypertonic saline too quickly, this means a lot of sodium uh, in serum. This will 
draw up all the water from the intracellular compartment of the brain cells. And this will move into the intravascular compartment very quickly, causing the brain cells to shrivel and shrink. Central pontine malonolysis is characterized by flaccid paralysis, dysarthria, and dysphagia. This disorder is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. So that concludes the video on hyponatremia.